are the you know high level Canadian elected officials who are doing this are they doing it because they're just ignorant or is there more to it some of them have to be uh, corrupted some of them have to be uh, undeclared agents of uh, of foreign states uh, look my book explains the case of what's believed to be the worst if not one of the worst intelligence uh, breaches in Canadian history we have the federal the RCMP's uh, former uh, head of intelligence for the whole national force who was basically, you know, helping the highest level money launderers and gangsters in the world evade detection, according to the allegations. This is Canada's top police intelligence official allegedly enriching himself from uh, gangsters, money launderers. uh, And uh, we, or my sources asked the question, you know, could he have been misdirecting Canada's federal police force from investigating Chinese organized crime, Chinese corruption, Chinese influence, the same with Iran. So that that points to one case of what looks like a very high level compromise. And uh, I looked at a number of politicians in the book that do appear, um, well, we'll say that they don't appear to be acting in Canada's interest. So whose are they acting in? It breaks my heart because when I think of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, I think of Due South. Dudley do right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I think of. Well, so what does this mean for the Five Eyes Security Alliance? If you talk to some of my more cynical sources, they would say that Canada, again, I hate to say it, is is in a bad position because it has become a bit of a weak link. I think uh, everyone to this point, not everyone, people that are watching closely would say that New Zealand would be probably the most endangered of infiltration concerns that they were starting to hew a little bit toward Beijing and away from the Five Eyes even. Certainly uh, some in Australia feel that way. But I think what my book shows is the the danger of compromise in Canada, if not equal, uh, is a concern. And you have to ask the question, uh, the other Five Eyes have said Huawei does not do business in this country. No, they're not going to run 5G because intelligence says that Huawei is a, you know, a military intelligence firm. We just uh, saw news today that uh, Huawei was declared a military, uh, essentially, corporation by the U.S. government. So you can't do business with it. The U.S. government goes further and further to, to blocking a military intelligence vector, as they see it. And yet Canada hasn't, hasn't taken that step at all. So you have to ask why. Is it naivety is it ignorance or are there some people that are could be in a you know a worse position than uh, willful blindness or ignorance well if you if canada you know catches these these high level you know canadian politician criminals they should just send them abroad <laughs> send them to uh, send them to, send them to china <laughs> to, well yeah no, i wouldn't wish that on a uh, you know, we, we laugh, but there there's a person uh, who was a tycoon who was in a, a hotel in Hong Kong. He was, uh, according to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal and everyone uh, at a high level, you know, taken in the cover of darkness. Uh, his female bodyguards were overpowered by uh, Chinese intelligence. And he's somewhere in China. We don't know if he's dead, and al- dead or alive. He, he wasn't only a Chinese citizen. He is also a citizen of Canada and I believe Antigua. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, I hope we can find out if he's alive someday. His name is uh, Jian, Zhao Jianhua. Yeah, I remember we did a, an episode about him. And the thing that stuck out to me is that he like he had decided that he only wanted female bodyguards. Right. That guy. Yeah. I think that influenced the thumbnail decision, <laughs> which influenced how many views it gets. So I know what the thumbnail for this episode is going to be. And well, Shelly hates me. Well, okay. I want to ask, Sam, about... Um, you mentioned New Zealand uh, and Australia mm. briefly and the Five Eyes. You know, a lot of the things that you talk about happening in Vancouver sound very familiar in other parts of the world, like Melbourne uh, with the real estate money. Uh, when we were, in, we were in New Zealand two years ago and Auckland was also crazy in this way where it seemed like there was a lot of money flowing in. Do you have a sense of whether... And we couldn't get any 
New Zealand politician to speak to us. That's true, too. Like there was just when we were in Australia, like Australian politicians were starting to speak out about Chinese Communist Party influence in Australia and New Zealand. It was just like nobody wanted to talk about it. Um, do you get the sense that this Vancouver model that you talked about is being implemented in other parts of the world? Without a doubt, uh, Australia and uh, Vancouver, so Melbourne and Vancouver, the pool of whale gamblers, organized crime is uh, it crossed. It's not exactly the same, but uh, my research showed that many of the whale gamblers active in Vancouver were, of course, active in the Australian casinos. We saw a bombshell investigative reporting out of Australia, I believe Nick McKenzie, uh, who I cite in the book, showing where Z a relative of Xi Jinping had flown into Australia to gamble. Uh, junkets connected to organized crime were also connected to sex trafficking, also connected to political influence, also connected to the United Front. We're facilitating that activity in Australia. And of course, it, it's just, you know, in a different city, it may look a little a little bit different, but the model is the same. So especially Vancouver and Australia, uh, almost match exactly. New Zealand, uh, I don't think the casinos are quite the same. It may take a different form, but uh, it almost seems the political element of, uh, of influence is the bigger concern in New Zealand. Well, I remember in Auckland, there were like junk houses going for two, three million dollars, right? And then like, at the time, it was kind of like, oh, well, this must just be all the influx of Chinese money. But now I'm like rethinking that as maybe that was actually a lot of it organized crime money that's coming in into Auckland as well. But we wouldn't know because no one from the government would talk to us. They're a little bit more shy than the, the Canadian officials, but not too much. But you're right. It You know, it again... 50,000 export limit is on the China side. For that money to get over to Auckland or Melbourne, the same underground banking and crime model has to be worked. Yeah, there needs to be some way for these rich, corrupt Chinese officials to get their money out of China. Though it is interesting. I'd always thought about that as like, these are officials who um, don't trust the system in China, are afraid of getting uh, taken down some anti-corruption purge, and so they're trying to get their money out of China. But... From your book, I, I get the sense that this is also part of this, you know, asymmetric warfare, unrestricted warfare, that there there are reasons why this is happening, not just for some official protecting their own interests or assets. I think that's exactly right. That That is the right conclusion. I, I come back to saying, you know, China, uh, the Politburo isn't a supercomputer. They make mistakes. So there is corruption. There are so-called naked officials, you know, running away and, uh, you know, sending money to their family members abroad. So corruption is part of it. But let's remember that uh, there is some intentionality. People are sent abroad once they're caught doing something bad in China. Maybe it's time for you to go set up abroad. Uh, you know, don't forget, we have your, your mother and father are still alive here. So you're going to do what we want you to do. So, of course, you know, the Lai Changxin case, it, it, it's a good case in point. He ran away once, you know, news broke of corruption involving the Politburo or very close to the Politburo. But he was involved in intelligence. He was corrupt. He's both at the same time. And I, I would I would argue that, uh, you know, that that's a good model to look at it. You could be working for Chinese intelligence and be self-interested, uh, be, a, you know, different areas of agency. But uh, so what do we draw from that? It's all bad for the West. It, it may be bad at some time for Beijing. It may be good at for, sometimes for Beijing. 